Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Christina. And thank you, David and Graham, for inviting me to speak here. It's an honor. Of, this is my favorite art school in uh, the country. And I didn't go here, but I haunt this, these lectures and contribute to benefits. And um, I think it's one of the last good art schools left, as I understand art schools. Um, before I show images, I'll just uh, give you a rundown. I was uh, born in 1952 in Minneapolis and um, wanted to be a painter immediately. And, uh, and that made things simpler. I was always going to be a painter. And I loved uh, N.C. Wyeth and Winslow Homer. And, um, and then when I was a teenager, um, became interested in pop, um, flashy stuff, Andy Warhol and um, Roy Lichtenstein, which didn't really serve me well. And then um, I went to Bard. I was dying to get out of Minneapolis and uh, went upstate to Bard. And my, teacher were, my teachers were color field painters, so that's, they were really pushing that. And um, so I tried to be an abstract expressionist for two years and did I don't maybe a hundred paintings in a, um, and thought this wasn't me and said, uh, I said, can you just teach me to paint like Manet? And they said, well, you don't want to do that. And I said, I think I do. I just, I don't have a handle on abstraction and it seems arbitrary to me. I, and I, I, there's something in me I want to, you know, I want to, I want to address narrative. And they, they shook their heads. Oh. So. Um, so, also the prospect of getting out of art school and being a um, cab driver, bartender, didn't appeal to me. So I um, transferred to Parsons and took painting, figurative painting and illustration, which did serve me well because I graduated in 75 and um, was an illustrator for five or six years. Which was good in Manhattan then. You could live for $400 a month and that was fine. And uh, so it was an easy living. And I worked one night a week and, uh, and then painted the other, the rest of the week. And um, getting my craft together and um, I, I sort of fell, I think my subject matter found me as much as I found it. Um, I, I've always been a big reader ever since I was a little kid, and um, so I'm, I'm sort of filled with books, and I'm filled with the movies that I see on a daily basis, and I'm filled with the travels to the places I've been and the places I want to go to, and a lot of wishful thinking. And so, anyhow, in my interior life, I have a sort of a fictional other world, and being a representational painter, I realize that's a handy you know, that's a subject matter there. So I started painting the perimeters of this world. And through my uh, fascination with art history, um, I could address a, a period or a painter and address uh, a time. It was often the past. I didn't paint the present. And I don't paint the present. And um, William Faulkner said, uh, the past isn't dead. It's not even past, which I thought was very good. And uh, I think the opening line of the go-between is, the past is a, another country. I think it's that one. Um, but anyhow, these, um, I don't think of that as nostalgia, but I, um, and I was very interested in sort of mid 20th century. And um, so with that, I think I'll start. I, so I had, 30 years of paintings to uh, go through. And um, we have the first slide. Oops. So I, I edited highly. Um, but I, uh, I was also interested in ghosts. And um, my first series was, um, this is Shakespeare, and, or the, called The Haunted Bookshop. And, uh, um, a ghost in front of Shakespeare and company. So I'd often try to combine, say, a love of a painter and a, and a book and a, 
anyhow, ma many things. So, um, and there was a, I wanted to, when I was a kid, I went to Europe when I was 10, and it made a big impression on me, and I never got over it. And um, there was something, the Europeanness, I, I thought, was um, just kind of delicious and mysterious and unknowable and the other. And so I did a series of um, Europe. This is called Boulevard. And when I was 30, I think the um, Metropolitan Museum bought this painting, and, uh, which is called The Letter. And I think I'd been reading Thomas Hardy or something like that, but I was, I mean, I was absolutely thrilled. And because um, I'd first been to the Met when I was in 1959 and um, thought, you know, this is the best place I've ever seen. Um, and anyhow, I thought, well, it, now my life is all different. And it didn't really change too much at all. Um, this is called Solitaire. I did a, I did a series of uh, solitary women, you know, writing letters, playing solitaire. And oh, and I work from um, black and white photographs. And uh, this was... Uh, Partial is Francis Farmer, the actress that went crazy. And um, this was done for an AIDS benefit. And uh, the challenge was transcendence, or how do you make a not terribly depressing painting about AIDS? So I was thinking of that song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And um, so had this fell up transcending. And then I, I was always doing, and still do, um, portraits of uh, heroes of mine. This is Dylan Thomas and Andre Durand in his studio with Model. F. Scott Fitzgerald, native son of St. Paul, Minnesota. James Joyce, this one's called uh, Paris Waits. And this is actually, um, God, I just can't remember her name, it's Freud's, what? Yeah, Carolyn Blackwood, standing outside the Colony Club in Soho or something. Um, initially, I was a Francophile and I was smitten by um, you know, the School of Paris and Modigliani and Gauguin. And um, somewhere in the 80s, I guess, I became fascinated by English art history and uh, the fact that it's not, not as well known. And also, they, have a, they had a current of figuration that we didn't really have in the United States that was very idiosyncratic. And England was still sort of isolated, an island culture. and. Um, and there was an eccentricity to it that I loved. And um, so I started making yearlier uh, pilgrimages to London to um, study painters and paintings. This is Edwin Dickinson, the um, American painter, who was um, very inspiring to me. And then, oh, this is, I think we're around 1987, and I did a, um, I'm Scottish descent, and I was, I went to um, Scotland with my parents to meet the Laird of the Clan and all that kind of stuff. And he told us our, that we went from Scotland to Ireland and then to Kentucky, and those hillbillies were actually Scottish clans, the Hatfields and the McCoys. In our case, the Hannahs and the Murrays. So I started doing some sort of, it was like roots, I guess. I was doing um, my Scottish heritage. So it was these sort of uh, more rural scenes. Most of my work's usually urban. And this painting, Mick Jagger bought, which I thought was terribly exciting after all the money spent on all those Rolling Stone records that it was my 
It was only fair. <laughs> and these paintings were quite big. I, I, don't, I don't paint quite so big anymore, but there was such a pressure in the 80s in New York to uh, just paint bigger and bigger. So I went along with it, but I didn't, um, I always maintained, I didn't really have big ideas. And um, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a conceptual painter. Even when I was an illustrator, which re relies on conceptualism so much, um, I, I worked in collage because I would just sort of give, give them a semblance of something kind of jazzy that didn't really, um, uh, it was just visually exciting. And um, whereas most illustrators try to, you know, actually say something. and. I always found that kind of limiting. So, um, uh, I mean, the paintings for me, it's, it's always a process. I need the desire to get going and then, you know, things happen while you're painting, but it's never, it's, it's, it's never, the, it never started with a brilliant idea. I mean, I just, I don't have brilliant ideas. Um, this is called Shirts and Skins, and um, the New Yorker wrote about this, and they said, Mr. Hanna has a, something like an unhealthy fascination with the flesh of young children. <laughs> Which I thought was ridiculous, because when I was a kid, and we'd play, you know, ball in a sandlot, we'd separate into teams, and that's what we called it, Shirts and Skins, and five would take off their shirts and five would leave them on and... But anyhow, you're, you're always seen through the lens of the culture that you're living in and... This is called, uh, Like This, Like That. And I try to set up a narrative where, um, I mean, I suppose one wonders, what are they looking at? Is it a dirty photograph or... Um, but anyhow, I, I like to put a clue, I mean, a, I like to set up a possible narrative without spelling out what exactly is going on. So it leaves something for the viewer to do. And I often turn the um, protagonist with his face away to... Um, uh, invite speculation, and also so that you could identify with the uh, fella. You know, it could be you. This is called um, New Boy, I think. Flyweights of the 50s. This is called Days of Small Sorrows. And this seems to be ambiguous. He could either be counting to a hundred, or weeping, or possibly taking a leak. <laughs> and um, I realized a lot of my paintings had a sort of boy's adventure uh, sense to them. So I, and I collect uh, old boy's adventure books from the teens and uh, like pre-Hardy Boy books. And, um, and they, all, they have great names like the Allied Boys or the Motorcycle Boys or the Radio Boys. Or, so I thought, well, I need my own boys. So I um, invented the Shipwreck Boys. So I placed my Shipwreck Boys at um, key spots. And this is the Shipwreck Boys in Copenhagen. A lot, of, a lot of these are wishful thinking. Um, this is, I mean, I've never been to Copenhagen, I've never been to this place, but, um, you know, in the course of a painting, which might take a month or six weeks, um, you know, you sort of dwell there. So um, it's definitely escapism for me. But while I'm painting something like this, I, um, I was always, since I studied with abstract painters, they were always telling us to keep turning it upside down and sideways and look at it in mirrors and, you know, to emphasize the 
formal qualities of painting. So I've always done that with figurative paintings too, so that I don't get in the trap of painting a picture, because I I want the painterliness to be equal to the story that it's telling or suggesting, which I find, um, so I try to get lost in the painting so that it's plastic elements are stronger. This is called A New Life. And then I, I did a, not intentionally, I, I do series without being aware of it. I realized I'd done a lot of paintings of men on cliffs, which um, maybe it's just the precariousness of being an artist. Um, uh, but I, I do like to paint a nice cliff. <laughs> and then, um, since I'd sort of been um, nodding at um, Boy's Adventure, I thought, um, and then the age of appropriation where everybody's stealing everything, I thought, why not just copy a Hardy Boys book and you'll find out what's the difference between one of your paintings and, and a real Hardy Boys book. But make it a nice juicy oil painting instead of, I assume, a watercolor, which it once was. So this is the house in the cliff, which really is a Hardy Boys book uh, without the type. But it was um, it was interesting experiment. And then, oh, another big influence on me was um, Alfred Hitchcock. And I loved the, um, he's sort of my favorite, and I love what you call establishing shots before the action really gets underway. And he's just kind of setting the scene, and maybe there's a, a low cello sound or something. But So you're, you're maybe looking at something beautiful, so, um, yet there's something ominous about it. And, and nothing's even happened yet. But I mean, because it's a Hitchcock movie, you obviously know something will. But I was interested in that um, kind of tension between can I paint a beautiful place and have it be somewhat sinister? Like in the 39 steps, the, our hero and heroine are being chased through the Scottish Highlands which is beautiful, but it's filled with menace. I mean, the police are after him, and the crooks, and spies, and everything else. And um, so anyhow, it was, to me, it was another way of looking at the landscape as a, as a psychological, almost like a stage set, where something, um, uh, a place of drama, as opposed to, you know, the, um, you know, in Poussin or something, where it's uh, idyllic and pastoral. This is called The Shore Road. And I started introducing um, cars into my pictures and uh, always trains. This is the Royal Scotsman. But I actually started in the late 70s. I started painting trains because the idea of um, travel was very interesting to me and I sometimes work from old black and white travel books. Um, and the idea, well I like the way I feel when I travel, that your identity is somewhat changed and, and who you are is sort of up for grabs and you, you look at something with fresh eyes. This is called Puddles. And then I, well, I've did an ongoing series of um, schoolboys and schoolgirls, um, usually segregated, um, schoolboys at their school or in town squares, um, influenced by Baltus quite a bit. And 
I think this one I was thinking of um, oh, Ferdinand Knopf, the way he has, um, it's usually women, but he just, they're like chess pieces placed on a green lawn. And I, there's something, well, I guess I thought about Hopper. Is Hopper is almost a surrealist, but there's, there's, not, there's not that thing that Magritte does, which pushes it over into uh, surrealism. But the setting is surreal, and the feeling is slightly eerie, and I like that feeling. Maybe something just about to happen, but hasn't happened yet. These are the, um, these are called the missing diplomats. But I was very interested in the Cambridge spies who were recruited in the 30s and unmasked in the 50s and 60s. And also this, the sense of the boulevardier or flaneur, a walker in the cities. So this, this is the start of the schoolgirl suite. I think this is called Ring Around the Rosy. And um, I did a lot of variations on things like this. Um, uh, because I like the way when children play, they seem to form tableaus like one sees in, you know, Greek vases and things. And so they automatically sort of go into this great um, composition that very useful for setting up a painting. This is called The Green Round after a novel by Arthur Mackin. Blind Man's Bluff. Schoolgirls. These two, um, I like the idea of um, spooky twins. And um, I had these two little snapshots of the same girl. And I thought, well, if, I, if I paint both of them, I've got identical twins, which is, could be spooky. This one was, when somebody's, when, the, when a figure's staring at the viewer, I often think it might be off-putting because it's slightly um, confrontational. I mean, she's looking right at you. And the source of her sorrow you become slightly, it's your responsibility, perhaps. But, um, I mean, this painting, which is of a very specific type of girl, the, I mean, the response I got from, a, from all different kinds of women was, oh, that was me. That was me when I was 10 with those knobby knees. And so, I mean, I always am looking for some sort of universal, um, definitely, just, you know, so the viewer can empathize and um, enter into the picture and be compelled. Which is why I tr try to stay from specificity too much. And this was, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but, well, triplets, spooky triplets in a full moon. But. I, I think this was inspired by that scene in The Shining with the spooky twins in the hallway. But I wouldn't want to be faced with this trio <laughs> on a midnight. And this is kind of a similar strange tableau. I rarely, I, I mean, I rarely show action. It's usually, um, still, which automatically gives you a uneasy quality. This, um, by this point, I was, 
um, smitten by Walter Sickert in the Camden Town School, and I think I've borrowed a lot of his um, palette here. Um, but I'd go to London and I'd look up all his old addresses and soak soak up. Uh, I mean, great thing about London is it's it's changed so much less than say New York has. So it's. I mean, I'm always sort of looking for that time travel experience, which one can do in North London. And then uh, is a series of ocean liners. This is called The Last of England, and um, it's the Queen Mary leaving Southampton. And uh, I guess I had a dealer once who he wanted, he said, paint something big. And I said, big like what? And he said, I don't know, what do you like that's big? And I said, like ocean liners. And he said, paint ocean liners. So anyhow, I thought, well, that's a good idea. I've always been in awe of ocean liners and ever since I was little. And um, it is a worthy thing to paint. And then, well, you, and you get to, you know, water and sky and, um, it has a lot to offer it. This is Malta. This is Ghost Ship. And then um, this is the start of some street scenes. One of my favorite paintings is The Street by Balthus. And, um, which is kind of the ultimate in tableaus. And it's very stage setty and I, you know, a street is, has, gives you the opportunity of staging your own drama. Um, so I did several of these. These are all rather large. This is called The British Agent. This is Good Girl, Bad Girl. I don't know which is which. One of the things I like about painting children is that, um, you know, they're unformed and it, it's, I don't actually like children myself, but I like the um, state of childhood and I like the, uh, I remember the intensity of it and the, the whole idea of innocence and experience and looking forward to something and what will it be and it's sort of terrifying and exquisitely exciting simultaneously. So I find them to be good protagonists for my paintings. And I, I did like being a child. And the, also when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the world and what I thought it was and what I, anyhow, what I, what I thought it was, I was all wrong about it. Um, but, and when I grew up, you know, I thought, I think I, I think I know what it, being adult's going to be like. And anyhow, it wasn't like that. And, um, but the discrepancy but between what I thought and what is, I thought was sort of an um, interesting area to develop. So a lot of these are sort of based on what I thought things were going to be like. This is called Let the Moon Hang Low. And I think this starts a series of uh, night pictures. This is actually a, a still from Blow Up. I rarely use a whole still, but this was so um, kind of intriguing. And I, so I did it in Grisai. Piccadilly Circus.
This, I think, is probably an allegory to being a mid-career painter. <laughs> Blindly fumbling along. Then I did, a, um, I did a show in London called Mysteries of London, which was a very... Um, most of my shows didn't have themes, but um, I thought it would be really fun to just limit myself to my subjective view of London, um, which wouldn't correspond to what a modern Londoner would think about his or her own city. But um, it, was, um, it was a good project. So Euston Station, in the Cafe Royale, where all the um, artists and writers used to meet, which has finally been torn down. They just left the facade, and behind that entrance is nothing, which is really sad. It's called In the City. These remind me of a, a like a trail of ducklings or something. <laughs> and some of these paintings are used for book covers. Um, this was used for a John Banville book. And now we come to Nova Pilbeam, who is an obscure British actress. It was born in 1919, and I, I saw this Hitchcock film called Young and Innocent, and I fell in love with her, and I watched it again and another 12 times, and, and, um, and I, she was sort of my perfect plucky English girl, and um, so I started a series on her, well, not knowing it'd be a series, but... Um, which continues, and... She, um, she's the perfect subject because nobody knows who she is. I mean, they assume I've invented her. Um, and last spring, I've written to her. She lives in North London, and uh, I've sent her my catalogs and mash notes and things like that. And um, last spring, I decided to go over to Nova's house and look up at her bedroom window, and, um, which I did. And anyhow, she's a recluse. She retired in 1952 when I was born. And her next door neighbor hasn't seen her, seen her once in 30 years. Anyhow, I was staring at the window like I often do, staring at Sickert's window or somebody's window, and um, she came to the window, looked right at me, as if summoned. <laughs> Anyhow, there's, there's a lot of these. Um, there's maybe 20 pill beam paintings. And this is, um, this is a rather risque picture. So I started, um, well, I started painting nudes regularly. I'd always, done, I'd always found it the hardest thing to paint and sort of the hardest thing to sell, but um, it was something I wanted to do. So anyhow, it's a series of um, ongoing nudes. This is called Regarding Renata. And this is uh, Cezanne's paint box. So now I'm going to move to um, PowerPoint. So, you know, here's Nova and the goldfish. This is called Upper Fifth. So these are all very recent. This is called Miss Thatcher. Italian movie. Catherine Spock.
This is called Little Angel. Um, this one's called Cautionary Tales, which is a, uh, no, it's, it's called, uh, oh, it's the Shipwreck Boys in Yorkshire. They're at a cricket match. Melbury Road. This is a street in London, which is um, Victorian painters' houses, back when painters were uh, like royals. And each house is, I mean, they're just fantastic. In this house, actually, Jimmy Page lives in now. This is St. James Square, um, which is a um, famous drop for espionage agents, Anthony Blunt and things like that. But there's, um, I've done a lot of, like, I, th I think of this as a spy picture. I mean, it's as much about um, um, Mondrian, early trees, as anything else. But there's certain, um, like, fiction genres that really haven't been dealt with in painting. I mean, Kitai, he, he was kind of liberating because he addressed all kinds of things that hadn't necessarily been addressed in paintings before, or so seemed to me, but kind of paved the way. I mean, he famously said, some books have paintings in them, some paintings have books in them. This is called uh, Prince and Princess. And um, I was painting this when the Mirandi show went up, and I was kind of stuck. And I saw the Mirandi show and the, his palette. I mean, that chateau was really sort of stolen out of Mirandi. And then I was, um, I started painting sports. I, I like George Stubbs, and I was thinking of uh, what's the equivalent of a beautiful racehorse? And I thought, well, to me, a beautiful European sports car. So I started painting sports cars in the spirit of Stubbs. So this is called The Weekend Mystery. And this is called Cookham, which is Stanley Spencer's hometown. Which I made a pilgrimage to. This is called Triumph in Brussels. Mykonos. It's called Speed Trials. This is called uh, French Gangster. This shape, I think, I got from Kitai too. He was uh, he was very um, unique in his, you know, pa painting a vertical like that. Speedboat figures on a beach. This is called Isle of Isla. And this was sort of reverting to something I did, I mean, long ago, which was you just um, take a figure and put it in front of something, um, which creates a situation. And the figure is actually um, the actress that played Jane in the Tarzan movies. This is called Windermere. Punting on the cam. Something like this. Um, this is from a little black and white photograph, and the, I mean, I just couldn't resist it because of the way the, it's bisected. It seemed like a ready-made. 
All these don't work out. I mean, I throw out about, I suppose, one out of three paintings. So it's not like, it's not a formula that works. And sometimes I go through a painting kind of hoping for an otherness that never happens. And I come up with sort of a pedestrian painting and I think, this just doesn't have that thing. But that, that thing is not something I can easily summon. It's not a, um, it's not formulaic. It's sort of this trial and error thing. And then I did a um, series of, well, I collect peng old penguin books and um, I loved them so much and I, and I thought, well, I want to do something with these. So I thought, well, pop art, go ahead. Why not? And um, so I painted one and then I painted 10 and 20 and I guess I've painted about 80 of them. But I do them with the, um, I mean, they sort of fit into the world that my paintings inhabit and the, each one's different because of the foxing and uh, distressed marks and tears and rips. And then I started uh, making some up too. I did uh, a show of poetry books, my favorite poetry books, um, which Penguin doesn't do. And I did portraits of friends, books they never wrote. And that is Sean Scully. <laughs> so I, I guess I've reached the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you.